Hi, it's David Avern. Welcome to Why Customers Leave, the podcast. You know, I find it mind-boggling that while we all know the importance of simplifying the buying process, too many in business are actually adding friction by making you change your passwords and fill out contact forms and talk to their chatbots. Well, my guest today has a lot to say about unnecessary and frustrating friction in your business and why it's costing you money and customers and even employees. I'm talking to the brilliant Roger Dooley, author of Friction, The Untapped Force That Can Be Your Most Powerful Advantage. I'm David Averin, and this is the Why Customers Leave the Podcast, back in 20 seconds. Are you ready to future-proof your business? Well, sit back because customer experience expert David Averin brings you the Why Customers Leave podcast, featuring outspoken thought leaders and business builders as they share their creative strategies for serving a new generation of customers and clients. Listen in, or you can watch the video version of the conversation. Now, here's David Averin. And welcome to Why Customers Leave the Podcast. I, of course, I was going to say, of course, I don't know if that's of course for everybody else. Of course, for me and for my family, I'm David Averin. And uh, and as as we look into this new year, and I know most of these podcasts are, are evergreen. You could be listening or, or at any time or watching the video version, uh, which is available on my website and also on my YouTube channel as well. Uh, I, it's I, I think there's a great opportunity to 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 clarify what's next. You know, I, I'm a speaker, um, as my guest is as well, and we'll introduce him here in a second. Um, you know, I, as I've been talking to a lot of meeting planners and others, saying what are companies looking for? Is the world has opened up again post pandemic? Um, and they said what they're looking for, we're hearing so much, is is clarity and optimism. Like, Claire, what does this mean? What has changed? What, is, what does it mean? What's the implications, ramifications on our business? And of course, optimism. I mean, nobody wants to come in with gloom and doom. And the good news is I'm, I am super optimistic. I think there's been some phenomenal innovations, uh, some phenomenal trends, and some cautious ones as well. Uh, but it's also important that we're really cognizant and conscious of the things that frustrate our customers. I mean, that, of course, is my my whole mantra of talking about why customers leave and, and becoming ridiculously easy to do business with. Well, there are few people smarter in this realm than my guest today, Roger Dooley. I, I freaking loved his book, um, Friction. So um, let me, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, for him, and we will uh, we'll say hi, and then and then delve into the subject. Roger Dooley is a serial entrepreneur, an author, an international keynote speaker, and the founder of Dooley Direct, which is a business consultancy. His books include the uh, the acclaimed and international bestseller Brain Fluence. 100 Ways to Persuade and Convince Consumers with Neuromarketing, and his book that I would love to talk about today that I'm holding up for those who are seeing the video version because I love this book. It's called Friction, the Untapped Force that Can Be Your Most Powerful Advantage. And it was named one of the best business books of 2019. He writes a popular blog called Neuromarketing, as well as a column at Forbes.com. Roger, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks for having me on the show, David. And I love the new name of your show, Why Customers Leave. I guess the uh, title of my latest book, Friction, would be the answer to that question. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it was kind of funny. It was was during COVID, um, it was less relevant because people leave because they can't leave their house and they're all masked up and everything else. But now that we're back to normal, at least a new normal or a new next or whatever we call it, um, I think some of these things that that you talk about so clearly, and I want to delve into all that, have become that much more important as we've seen a whole rash of new conveniences and ways to buy and, and disruptions into the traditional process. And in almost every case, those disruptions are preferable because they're easier or faster or simpler. Talk to us about um, about the, the genesis of the book and your work in helping organizations reduce friction. I guess it really stems back to uh, my trying to explain uh, how to convert customers better or how to change any behavior. Uh, I focus a lot on conversion because that's near and dear to the hearts of many marketers. How do we turn these visitors into buyers? Sure. Uh, and I was focused on multiple aspects of that uh, motivation not both conscious motivators like discounts and free things and such, uh, and the product characteristic itself, uh, but also non-conscious motivators. Uh, that's what I wrote about in Brain Fluence, using behavioral science to change behaviors, to make people a little bit more likely to be persuaded. And uh, I, I should caution, add a one word of caution here. I, when I talk about that, I always want 
uh, anybody who's listening to use these techniques in an ethical way, because if used wrong, they can be manipulative, but sure. Uh, hopefully uh, we are doing this to help customers get to a better place. But in any event, uh, one of the things uh, I created a little framework called the persuasion slide, uh, which was all about how to change behavior. And it was based loosely on the work of a scientist named BJ Fogg from Stanford who created the Fogg behavior model. Uh, but it was also a means to try and explain to marketers, well, how do you use those conscious marketing aspects that like what's your what's your product do? Does it perform well? How does it compare to the competition? Uh, what's the price? And non-conscious motivators, uh, things like uh, using uh, scarcity, reciprocity, uh, and many of the other sort of loss aversion, uh, other cognitive biases. There's so many ways to use non-conscious persuasion. But one of the elements uh, in the slide, uh, and basically you visualize the customer at the top of the slide, and you're trying to get the customer to the bottom uh, is friction. If you've ever seen a child get sl stuck halfway down the slide, uh, that's because of we were all that not slippery enough. Yeah, exactly that's right. That's right. So in any case, uh, that uh, I started focusing on friction as the uh, maybe the most important element of the slide because it's the most overlooked. Uh, we, as business people, we focus on motivation, uh, but often neglect the friction aspects when we're trying to get more sales, convert more customers. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, definitely, definitely based on the experience we all had as, as children, whether it was the rusty slide or the water slide at the community pool, if it's not well lubricated, you scooch all the way down and, and get burned on your legs or whatever that might be. And I, I think it's a perfect analogy when you're looking at a world and we're looking at a world of, of pervasive quality. I mean, everybody's good. Um, the differentiator, I think, in, early in my career you know, was, was the words that we use to describe what we do. How do we better persuade people? And the reality today is we've come to the recognition that what we say about ourselves is less important, not unimportant, but less important than what other people say about us. And friction seems to be one of the primary drivers of those online comments, negative reviews, and other things as well. When 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 people are, are frustrated because a process is what they, and I love the way you talked about this in the book, is their perception of that experience, their perception of whether or not it was unnecessarily complicated or unnecessarily time consuming. It might be fine for their industry, but we're comparing against Amazon or others, right? So talk about, about, about that, that friction being that, that, that primary driver today of, of po both positive or negative. Right. Well, there's some amazing work done by Gartner who surveyed thousands of customer service interactions where somebody had to call up a company or interact with a company in some way, whether it was a return, a, a technical question, some other kind of issue with the product. Uh, and what they found was pretty amazing. Uh, my topic is loyalty, which is sort of the flip side of why customers leave. And sure. uh, what Gartner found was that customers who felt they had a high effort experience or about 96% likely to say they would be disloyal to the company. That's 10, 10 times as high as those who said they had a low effort experience. Uh, and that's that's a pretty startling number. Uh, the number that was perhaps even more startling uh, was what happened to word of mouth. You know, today, yeah. David, we know that word of mouth is so critical. Uh, people want reviews, they want ratings, they want to know what other people think before they pull the trigger on something. Customers who said they had a high effort interaction, 88% said they would say bad things about the brand to other people compared to just 1% of the low effort customers. Uh, that's 88% versus 1%. And, and your point about the perception of effort is exactly true because people aren't today just comparing you to your competitors. I mean, hey, I compare one cable company against another cable company and they all suck, right? Exactly. Uh, in, the, instead, they are comparing your experience to whatever they think is low effort. And you mentioned a couple of brands, Amazon, Zoom, and Uber, and so on. Uh, and if you are making them work harder, if your processes aren't quite as seamless as theirs, then you could be high effort, even if you seem like you you stack up pretty well compared to the competition. Right. <clears throat> or it, it, compared to even what it was five years ago, right? I mean, we can talk about being spoiled. Okay. But, but it's our perception of was it a waste of our time? And the only thing we don't get more of is time. And occasionally I'll, I'll post something online. I'm not a big fan of people ranting against, against companies online because oftentimes it's that one single worker and it's not necessarily fair. It's better to complain to them 
let them address and see what we can do. But if I post something that was frustrating, there, there's the inevitable rash of people around the world are saying, oh, first world problems. Okay, perhaps, but a problem in the mind of your customer is a problem. And you look at lifetime value. Um, one of the things I, I love that you talked about is that the whole idea of that the, the behavioral economics, right? Um, and, and I'm going to quote this exactly as it's in the book, and I'm sure it's from somebody else because you did a great job of, of citing a lot of source and a lot of studies. So the level of action is inversely proportionate to the level of friction, right? When you make things easier, people do more of it. When it's more difficult, people do less of it. And it sounds intuitive, but what are companies missing? I, th I think they don't see the friction in their own processes because, first of all, they know how are to they do too, these Are they too themselves. close to it? Yeah, well, exactly. You know, if you ever ask somebody to uh, review their uh, new website where they were involved in the design process, uh, they will point out how easy everything is. Right. But give that to a total stranger, or maybe who isn't even that uh, technically oriented, uh, you know, give it to your mom or uh, your grandfather or something uh, and say, okay, uh, try and uh, place an order or try and get product information or whatever the purpose of the website is. Uh, and you may well find they struggle. Things that seem obvious uh, to you uh, simply aren't that obvious. And so often we just rely on our instinct instead of testing, whether it's a website, a mobile app, uh, an in-store process or anything else. And, you know, little bits of effort make a huge difference. I, I think that's perhaps the biggest reason things aren't better. Companies just assume, well, that's normal. It's a little bit of effort is okay. And what I would contrast that with David is Amazon and one-click ordering. Sure. Way back in 1999, they got a patent for one-click ordering, which meant you could see a product and click that buy with one click button, and you know, two days or less later, be on your doorstep. And I have to admit, I have clicked that button far too many times in my life. Yeah. That truck is always showing up in front of my house. But uh, they were challenged almost immediately uh, by folks who said, well, you can't patent something that obvious. Their biggest competitor at the time, when they were primarily a bookseller, was Barnes & Noble, the big bookstore chain. They put a similar feature on their website, and pretty soon they were locked in a big legal fight with Amazon. Uh, and after years in court, millions of dollars in legal fees, Amazon won. Their patent was declared valid. And David, what did they get for all those, all that money, all that management time and effort? All the effort they imposed on their competition was one tiny little click. Barnes & Noble had to add one more click. They added a confirm order click after their buy now click. That's all. You know, that doesn't seem like it'd be worth millions of dollars, but it was right. worth it to Amazon. They said, you know, this one tiny little bit of effort differential between us and the competition is going to be a game changer. Uh, and there was one other person at the time who was pretty smart uh, who saw that same opportunity. That was Steve Jobs at Apple. Uh, Apple paid Amazon $1 million so they too could have that one tiny little click advantage over their competition. You know what's and, crazy is is it's been it's yeah, been I mean, how many companies I would say well we can't fix it. Yeah. yeah we realize that's a little bit clunky on our website or the mobile app but boy that would cost thousands of dollars to fix so we'll, we'll leave it till next uh, next fiscal right but and and now where are we we're 14 years later and how many companies are overly complex I love and you detail this very well in the book um no there's no shortage of people that talk about Amazon but you you couched it in terms of the simplicity of the process. And I think you could probably connect something like Uber as well as a great disruption. You can just get out of the, out of the car. You don't have to fumble for your, your credit card. You don't have to sit in traffic, double parked in New York city in a cab. Uh, there's a better way of doing it. Of course, the, the cabs resisted for too long. Um, but it, it's astonishing to me how many others don't. Every time I'm, if I'm at the gym or I'm in the car and I need to pull out my credit card and type it in again, or of course, if you type in your one something wrong, you have to go back and do your username again. Once again, first world problems, but there are so many phenomenal examples of companies that that actually do it well. Um, they're, they're, there's crazy, uh, unnecessary um, complications. And you see it, you see it in the behavior, you see it in the, in the, in the abandoned shopping carts. I think you have a great uh, statistic. I think it's a few years old is probably over four or 5 trillion by now, the number of abandoned shopping carts, um, virtual shopping carts on sites because they got frustrated in the middle of the process. Talk about that. Yeah. And actually the latest data, I just checked that a couple of days ago, uh, the latest data shows that almost as many shopping carts are banned today 
uh, as a percentage of the total um, versus when I wrote the book. Uh, it's about, I think, 67%, 68% on average now. And it, of course, it varies by company, by industry. Some are much better. Uh, and of course, Amazon eliminated that problem with one click because there is no shopping cart. The order goes straight to the warehouse. There's right. no chance for somebody to change their mind. But uh, but for most companies, they still use shopping carts and you can still use a shopping cart at Amazon, of course. Sure. Uh, and what the data shows is that uh, there are a variety of reasons why people abandon their shopping cart. Sometimes they put something in there uh, just to check the price or to check shipping because it wasn't clear. Sure. Uh, but uh, the majority of reasons for shopping cart abandonment when they've done surveys of customers who actually did leave their shopping carts uh, abandoned uh, were frictional in nature. Oh, uh, the checkout process was kind of complicated, or I couldn't check out as a guest. I had to set up an account with a company. Uh, and gee, you know, I didn't have my, uh, uh, you know, credit card information uh, handy, and it wouldn't let me autofill my credit card from my browser, which, you know, that, that's such a common error, David. Even today, uh, you know, autofill will fill in all of the data on a form for you. I know. If, if, code, if the site is coded correctly, but so often, I would guess half the time, uh, when I go to fill in a form, whether it's something related to e-commerce, like a checkout form or some other information request form, it has not been coded correctly uh, to autofill for me. So I end up having to type everything in. And, you know, in some cases, that effort is going to be just uh, too much, especially like if I don't have that information there with me. You know, I don't have my credit card uh, handy. Well, I can't do it because it's, it won't autofill for me. Right. And, you know, it's just little things like that that companies don't see make such a huge difference. Right. And and for those who are watching and listening to this, once uh, again, talking to Roger Dooley, author of Friction, um, lest you think this is petty, it's not so hard. The reality is we're looking at this from a business perspective, right? A lost customer, what's the lifetime value of a customer? And for those, because something is unnecessarily complicated, or once again, if it works well for you, there are points of friction. I'm going to tell you, Roger, I'm the guy, and, and I'm not proud of this, but I, I'm a guy who actually abandoned a real shopping cart at the grocery store at Walmart. I was halfway through, I had a massive cart full. And by the ninth thing that it didn't, unexpected item in the bagging thing, I couldn't get somebody to come over. I've got one of the, the guns, pricing guns. And I just start shooting everybody with the pricing gun and the people, and they're kind of looking at me. I'm like, this this, this doesn't work, look on my face. And halfway through, I, I just, I went home. I was so frustrated. My wife is an angel. She's really good at stuff. I hate it. Just at least give us a choice. And I get home and she says, so do you need help bringing the groceries in? I said, I don't have them. She goes, I thought you went shopping. I said, I did. And she said, well, where? I said, I, I left them in the cart at Walmart at the self-checkout. Mm -hmm. She says, you're serious. I said, it was just so frustrating. Like what's going to take me an hour somebody else could do in 10 minutes. Now I'm not naive. I understand the, the financial pressures. But I think we can both agree, my God, just give people options, like real options. Right. You know, and I think uh, there's there's a couple of points that I can make about that. You know, you are a, a relatively rare example of a physical shopping cart abandoner, but it does happen. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, know. you know, and self-checkout, I think, uh, is used incorrectly by many companies. I think self-checkout can be a great option. OK, if I've got, uh, you know, just two items and they're clearly barcoded, I will always go for the self-checkout where I can just sure. zip through. Don't have to do anything. Uh, it's so simple. Uh, but if I've got a cartload of stuff, some of which maybe is produce and needs to be weighed or have codes entered or something like that, uh, I am going to be very inefficient at that. So uh, if a company is forcing me into self-checkout, if, if they have inadequate cashiers where <clears throat> they've got one cashier and there's like 10 people in line, uh, then I too Norm. would abandon my cart. I mean, that's not the way to do it. You want to give the customer their preferred option. And if my preferred option is a cashier, I would like to expect, I'd like to see a cashier available without a lengthy wait. And, you know, Amazon is working on this problem in two ways. Uh, I keep coming back to Amazon, but their focus is the on gold friction. standard. Jeff, Jeff Bezos himself said, when you reduce friction, make something easy, people do more of it. And that has guide, been their guiding principle uh, for the last couple of decades. But in their in retail, uh, they've got a couple of innovations, and I just wrote about one of them at Forbes literally two days ago. Uh, but uh, one innovation has been out there for a while, and that is uh, the uh, just uh, just walk out shopping, where right. your products are scanned as you put them uh, in your cart, and then you can basically just uh, leave. Uh, you won't have a checkout process at all. So I mean that that's even better than uh, cashier checkout, right? Uh, the other one that I wrote about 
uh, is a little bit simpler of an innovation. Uh, and it is uh, Amazon One. And what it is, is a little palm scanner at the checkout. Uh, I'm lucky in Austin, we're the headquarters for Whole Foods, which is now part of Amazon. Uh, and we're one of the uh, test sites for Amazon uh, One. Uh, as you check out, the cashiers ring up your stuff, you pass your palm over uh, a little palm scanner and it immediately applies your prime discounts, which uh, often there are some, if you're shopping at Whole Foods and you're a prime member, you'll get right. uh, significant uh, discounts on sale items. Uh, so it gets your loyalty information automatically and it gets your payment information that you've previously stored. So uh, what that means, somebody said, well, what's the big deal? I mean, it's not that difficult to pull out a mobile app or something. Uh, this doesn't require you to have anything. You don't need your phone. You don't need your wallet with your credit card in it. Uh, you know, I have occasionally uh, gotten to the store, uh, gotten almost to the checkout and realized, oh, darn, you know, I left uh, my credit card at home or in the car or something. And sure. suddenly I've got this dilemma of, okay, how am I going to check out here? Uh, you know, there, there's none of that. And uh, one of my, I posted about this on Facebook and one of my uh, friends said, well, what's the big deal? And I pointed out that, okay, uh, without that little uh, innovation of a single swipe of your palm, the process would be for me to, first of all, uh, pull out my phone from my pocket, open up the Whole Foods Act, find the QR code, scan it. So, okay, I've got my loyalty information entered. Now I have to put my phone away, get my wallet out, get my credit card out, and then insert that uh, and go through that process uh, and then finally return it to my wallet and put that back in my pocket. Now, uh, as you mentioned, you know, this is kind of a first world problem. It's not that difficult of a process, but- But when um, you have choices- That little palm scan eliminates you know, probably uh, six or seven discrete little steps of effort. Um, and, you know, yeah, it's like one click isn't a big deal, right? Well, it made a big difference for Amazon and for iTunes. Uh, and so I can easily see uh, how people will view this as just a nice little convenience that they prefer. In fact, now if I'm checking out Whole Foods, so they have a couple of registers uh, in different parts of the stores that don't have that installed yet. Uh, I will go through a line that has it because I know it's going to be much easier. Right. You know, I think what we're seeing a lot, and you talk about this a little bit in the in the book, Friction, is <clears throat> companies that make things a little unnecessarily complicated because they're so eager to capture your information. And so it's when you can do a free trial, but you can't do a free trial unless you put in your credit card information first, right? Uh, or you want to uh, you want to be able to buy something, but you need to create an account to make all of that happen. I, I had the same thing. I was going through a Wendy's and I saw they had some special for uh, uh, some some breakfast thing as well. And of course, that's the nature of just getting lots of text messages over and over again because I'm on a family text. If I can figure out how to let's turn that off, there we go, even better. Um, and, I, and I'm going through and I go through there and they said, yeah, you've got, they've got the special deal, but you got to do it through the app. And I said, well, I'm at the drive through and they said, no, you need to download the app to make it happen. This was almost comical. And, you know, for those of us, we always say for speakers, you don't have bad things happen. We just get new stories to tell. So I said, all right, let's see what this is going to take. And fortunately, I had a little bit of time. So I had to pull out of the, the drive through line. I had to download the app. Then I had to pull out my wallet, enter the credit card information, all of that, just to be able to get my dollar off, which I wouldn't have done had I not been looking for good content. But they were so intent on making sure that I had their app, they had my information, my credit card, my content, that I literally had to get out of it. And I said, I'm already in the line. And they said, we can't, we don't have a, a process for that. And so we're seeing a lot of this um, very complicated. What's, what would be your advice to organizations who are trying to balance that they, they so want to capture your information. They have contact forms on their website that nobody wants um, with what we prefer as customers or clients or prospects or patients. How, how do you how do you balance that? Right. Well, first of all, uh, do not put uh, an international keynote speaker through that kind of process, because uh, if you think word of mouth is bad, uh, try word of mouth when that story is amplified by <laughs> That's, what, global that's what I'm saying. I know. Uh, yeah. I, uh, you know, in fact, it, it, uh, to do a little side anecdote, uh, long before the internet was a thing and social media was a thing, I recall hearing a presentation from a speaker who told a story about uh, how he made a special trip. He was uh, having a cookout uh, for family and friends. Uh, they did not have pickles, made a special trip to the store for pickles, got a jar of pickles, 
I got home, opened it up, and one of them appeared to have a bite out of it, uh, like somebody had opened the jar and taken a bite. So we ran back to the store and immediately had this incredibly difficult experience where basically uh, the implication was that they were that he was lying about it, was trying to get a free jar of pickles or something. Uh, and he um, ended up getting it, but it was a, an awful experience where they finally just slung the new jar of pickles across uh, uh, the checkout at him. And uh, he pointed out the point he was making was not um, so much about pickles or the supermarket, but that he told that story to millions of people. But he, he actually did a count and uh, it had gone to, gone to more than a million people for that one bad customer experience. So, uh, you know, I, these things can amplify far beyond what you might expect. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's a desire to get people's information uh, because you can market to them. But, you know, Trump maybe provide a backup system. You know, if, if somebody's in checkout line uh, and they need it and they don't have the app, there should be a, something that that person, the customer person, uh, service person can do, the, the checkout person say, okay, hey, uh, I'll take care of you this time, but uh, will you please download the app and install right. it for the just next time? Just empowering people. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, just, just let the people on, uh, on the spot to deal with it. We've got a great uh, uh, supermarket here in Texas, uh, and they're only in Texas, uh, and that is HEB. Uh, people from everybody in Texas knows HEB. Uh, people outside of Texas uh, only hear but occasionally, uh, but they do that with their people. You know, if you've got a problem, uh, I, I've seen them solve problems. One in one case, I got uh, uh, I failed to get a two for one deal uh, that I saw in an ad later. You know, instead of going through some complicated uh, accounting process, uh, the customer service person says. Um, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, you know, that was actually for this other kind of store, the store that you bought this and didn't have that deal available. But just, just go ahead and uh, get one. Uh, you know, just go pick one out. I said, well, do I need a receipt or anything? No, no, just just go uh, get one of the same kind you got before. And, are, are you, you know, are you, that, and I, and that no, made me ahead, feel please. so good. Hey, they trust me. They don't think I'm trying to somehow cheat them out of a flower pot. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and, you know, to me, that uh, and many other experiences are like that. That's how you build brand loyalty. Would I go to their competitor? Well, I, I had an opposite experience of their competitor where, uh, it reminded me of a pickle story, I got some olives that were moldy. Uh, and I got into a big argument with a produce manager that A, they were supposed to look like that because they were blue cheese olives. And no, they're not supposed to have fuzz growing off of them. But right. uh, finally he said, look, these refrigerators, they're not moldy. And he was really mad. He's going to show me how refrigerator they are. He opens up the thing and says, oh, hey, looks like the refrigeration unit's down. And it was, it was kind of embarrassing for him, but I mean, to put a customer through that process, arguing about whether olives have mold right. on them, when right. they clearly do, you know, it's, it's, it's we, crazy. Our, our colleague, um, our terrific colleague, Shep Hyken, has a whole philosophy. I can't remember what the product is, but it, it, the philosophy is around basically don't smell the jar. Like when someone says, this doesn't smell right, you don't smell it and just see if they're, they're trying, like, it's, it's nothing. I mean, even with Amazon nowadays, if there's something, a fairly low price item, it comes back wrong. They'll send you a new one. They say, don't even send it back, right? right? Depending on what it is, because it just doesn't make sense to, to pay for that as well. When we talk about, about sort of frustration and friction, and you can interchange the words and complication of the process, what I really liked about the book was that you talk about how that translates into different aspects in our life, what taxes do in terms of our motivation, even internationally, what company, what countries are difficult to do business with. But I loved what you talked about internally within an organization and that friction within an organization is synonymous with red tape. Talk about that. Well, exactly. And, you know, we could, we could vote an entire podcast to employee experience and employee engagement, but uh, in this country, uh, we have a problem. Only one out of three employees, according to Gallup, is actively engaged with their work or their workplace. Uh, two out of three aren't, uh, which, you know, imagine if you're trying to deliver fantastic customer experience, if two out of three of your people aren't really engaged with the company, they're just biding right. their time there, you know, picking up their paycheck, uh, they're not going to deliver that fantastic customer experience. Uh, and it's even worse globally. Globally, it uh, averages one in five. And uh, I just uh, did a keynote in Milan, Italy, and I'm sad to say in Italy, uh, the number, according to Gallup, is only one out of 25. That's down from one out of 20 a few years before the pandemic. Wow. Uh, imagine that if only one out of 25 of your people, I'm hoping there's some companies that do much better than that. I'm sure yeah. there are. But if only one out of 25 of your people are engaged, you know, how productive is your company going to be? How 
what kind of customer service, if customer experience are they going to deliver and so on. But what what case, do you attribute uh, that to? Is it leadership or is it unnecessary process that's frustrating? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's everything. You know, there, there are a lot of things. So, it, you know, just bad management is one. People, there's sure. you know, where there's not communication. Uh, you know, there's no recognition of the work that people are doing. There are a lot of reasons. But the one that I focus <clears> on uh, are uh, unnecessary processes, uh, things like uh, forms that people have to fill out uh, uh, to do something, for example, in the company that, where they don't really need that, checks and balances, layers of approval, uh, complicated expense reporting processes. You know, uh, I've been a, an entrepreneur for decades, uh, uh, but I had a corporate stint for a few years after I sold a business uh, and I joined the company as uh, VP of digital marketing uh, as part of the uh, contractual sale. And um, I had to fill out an expense report like everybody else. And what I found was uh, even an item as small as a $2 cup of coffee, if you can still find one of those, uh, had to be documented with a piece of paper. Right. Now, you know, uh, this was an incredible waste of time. I was submitting uh, expense reports that had, you know, all these little pieces of paper. I would lose them, of course, occasionally or forget to get one uh, and I wouldn't get reimbursed for that. Uh, and it was an insane process. Uh, which was not required by law. Uh, the IRS has much more liberal guidelines in the U.S. Sure. Uh, as far as documenting expenses. But uh, later on, after I left the company, and uh, I spoke to the controller, who at that point had also left the company, and said, why did you do that? Uh, you know, it's just so much work because they actually check those things. Like, not only did I have to go through the effort, somebody, somebody had to review it. In the accounting, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And they did. One time they caught me on one. I had a $2 expense, but I lost the receipt, and they, they actually caught me on it. Uh, but uh, I asked me, he said, well, we didn't trust uh, that people wouldn't somehow uh, abuse the system. And trust is so important. You know, when you show people you trust them, they are more likely to trust you. Trust is reciprocated. And trust is a huge indicator of company performance. Yeah. Uh, Paul Zak, the oxytocin researcher, who discovered that oxytocin is the hormone of human trust, he found that he and his team went into high-performing and low-performing low companies did thousands of surveys asking people about different things in the company, including trust levels. Oh, do you trust the company? Do you trust your boss? Do they trust you? And so on. And also, they did something kind of strange. They took thousands of blood samples. Oh, God. Uh, when they got back to their lab and analyzed all the data, what they found was pretty amazing. The high-performing companies were high-trust companies, not only as indicated by the surveys, but as indicated by the levels of oxytocin in people's bloodstreams. God, I so, thought you were saying they were you know, taking trust, blood to, to identify people who were stealing from the company. Well, there you go. Uh, it's it's some companies that. might try that. You you might, know, we need yeah. a DNA sample. Uh, we, we have some paper clips missing uh, from the supply cabinet. You know, uh, no, it's uh, and it's so important when you hit, and often the reason for these processes like uh, complicated expense reporting or. Uh, gee, you know, you need a uh, your stapler broke. You need a new stapler, and you've got to fill out a form and requisition, requisition one or form. Something. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you know, companies have this because they don't trust their people not to steal stuff. They really need to ask themselves, you know, are people really going to steal stuff? If you do occasionally lose something, how is that going to compare uh, in the, the dollar value and monetary value uh, to the lack of productivity, uh, the lack of trust that you're creating, and everything else? You know, one. Uh, uh, Netflix has gone to a very different approach. The no rules. Right, because everybody was sharing. Right, yeah. Right. Right. They threw out their uh, employee handbook uh, that had all these guidelines for travel and everything else. You know, if you got to travel, uh, they don't dictate exactly how you have to make the reservation or how you, uh, you know, have to do things. Uh, they say do it in the make sure it's in the best interest of the company. Yeah. You know? And same thing for you know, if you're going to entertain a client, it's not like well, there's a limit on uh, how much you can spend or anything else, but. Uh, do it and make sure it's in the best interest of the company. And if they have a problem, uh, they may tell somebody, okay, hey, uh, you know, you're kind of overdoing it here. Uh, and if it's not corrected, they might even uh, then clamp down on that particular situation. But basically they trust everybody until they somehow, somebody shows that they don't deserve that trust. And right. to me, what? that's a, a strategy that we all could use. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and a lot of the studies show that the vast majority of theft is internal anyway, but it's, we still walk out of Costco and have to show our receipt. I think a big takeaway for business is we got a couple of minutes here left is that revisit your process. Uh, a lot of people are following process. They don't even know how the, it came about or who designed it or maybe, it, um, um, you know, their predecessors. 
had put something in place as a reaction to some event, right? We all take off our shoes at the airport because that one guy, you know, had a, a bomb in his shoe. And so I, I think we're seeing smart company leaders coming in and slashing process, simplifying, expediting. But I think anybody can do that within their company is walk their customer's journey, walk their employee's journey and incentivize the identification of, of obsolete and onerous processes. Do you agree? Absolutely. And, you know, your people actually have many of the answers, David, you know, when, yeah. you, when you, if you simply ask uh, your frontline people, what do customers complain about, or ask anybody in your company, what would make your job easier? How are we wasting That's your time? That's the right time? question. They, they will identify those things. They know when their time is being wasted. I knew my time was being wasted when I was you know, fooling around with $2 receipts. Nobody ever asked me. And if I told them, they didn't want to hear about it. You know, it's, hey, that's, that's how we do it here. And, you know, if you ask people, they'll tell you. And often, too, people, um, I've, I've read quite a bit of literature on process simplification. And one of the things is that's pretty common is you ask people uh, about what rules would you eliminate? Okay, if, if, you, if we could eliminate some stupid rules that are wasting your time, they often identify some stupid rules that are wasting their time, but half the time, the rule that they identify isn't even a rule at all. It was a practice that's been handed right, down from person to person, and nobody ever thought to question it. Love it. Just taking notes here myself. Uh, talking to uh, Roger Dooley, the author, as I show it on screen here, of Friction. The untapped force that can be your most powerful advantage, and of course, brain fluence as well. We like to end the show with a quick speed round. Okay, simple answers, very quick, whatever comes to your mind. You ready? Uh, I'm ready. I have not prepared for this, so we'll see how speedy. Well, you're not supposed to. That's the whole idea of a speed round. Just real okay. Quick. Okay. Um, PC or Mac? Both. Okay, good answer. Because all right, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, meat <laughs> or plant based? Meat. Hey, I'm from Texas. Got to have barbecue. Yeah, there you go. I say you you, you would uh, you be asked to leave the state. Um, shopping mall or online shopping? Totally online. Uh, I almost never go into a mall anymore. Food court is probably the, the best part of it. Uh, Instagram or TikTok? Uh, Instagram. Not to, not into TikTok. There's only so many platforms that I can handle, and I haven't gotten into TikTok, sadly. Yeah, I'm Instagram for business. TikTok just to veg at the end of the night. Um, in recent years, what do you think is the worst business innovation or business trend? The worst business trend? Wow. Uh, I don't know. Two-factor authentication may be where it's not needed. Uh, you know, it's, I understand why it's necessary in some cases, but where it's not needed. I just even Zoom, who I use in my speeches as an example of frictionless, and their motto includes the word frictionless. I had had terrible uh, two-factor authentication process where I had to enter a code. I just set up a new computer prior to this interview. I had to enter a, um, uh, a six-digit six code, uh, that, and I only had 10 minutes to do it, and the email wasn't coming. I missed, like, two opportunities uh, to do it before I finally got one within the 10-minute window. Go got figure. it. Best business innovation or best business trend? What's, what's new that you're really excited about? I think uh, the overall emphasis on making things easier. You know, uh, we, we talk a lot about the companies that don't get making things easy right, but in fact, many companies are really striving for that. And to me, uh, we're seeing that more shopping is so much easier now. The pandemic uh, let us place online orders that somebody will put right in your trunk for you and things like that. Uh, those things aren't going away. Uh, they're, they're here to stay because they're easy. Yeah, delivery, the best of the best. Um, Tupper question, what do you think is the best thing to come out of COVID? Hmm. Uh, I think, well, I'll, I'll give you two answers for that. You know, I think that uh, the use of virtual uh, as a means of uh, working, communicating, uh, even giving speeches, uh, I think that even though we all wanted to get back in person, and I've had some great in-person experiences since then, I've seen people uh, practically breaking down in tears when they saw people they hadn't seen in three years. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I mean, that's been great. But I think that a recognition that that's a, a valuable channel and it can be a uh, very powerful too. I think that's, that's one. And then you know, the other is just the uh, development of new methods of convenient uh, convenience for shopping and a lot of other things. We found better ways to do things that now aren't going away, you know, like delivery, like uh, curbside and pickup and so on. Good. Perfect. What's the best part of getting back to traveling again? Hmm. I don't, you know, I've, uh, 
never been you know one of those people who says wow I really uh, enjoy travel uh, because when once you, when you do enough of it uh, you know it, it can get to be a grind but uh, I think just the excitement of being in a different environment totally you know I did uh, a couple speeches in Berlin uh, did uh, one in Milan all in the last uh, I don't know six eight weeks or something uh, and being in a different place uh, was really I think a lot of a lot of fun. And it gets your mind in, into a different space, too. You know, when you're uh, sitting in uh, your office connecting remotely everywhere, uh, your, your mind gets kind of in a rut. And so I think that travel opens you up to new things. Yeah, the destination. That's the best part of it. Uh, what's your favorite city that you've spoken in? Hmm. Maybe I'll go with my most recent one, uh, Milan. Uh, you know, I think that uh, there's uh, the food is so great. Uh, there, uh, the architecture is uh, so fascinating. The there, fashion is uh, great, and the people are so warm. Yeah, absolutely. Last question: What's your proudest dad moment? I know you got two kids. You got a son and a daughter. Both of them in in uh, digital marketing as well. As as yeah, do I. Think, I. Yeah, let's see. Uh, you know, proudest dad moment uh, would. Uh, be uh, difficult because that might admit, might mean uh, singling out uh, one uh, uh, child over the other. Oh, they're not watching. You know, I think, they're I not think, watching. Right, right. No, no, no. But nobody, nobody's listening to this. I don't think. No, I, you know, to me, I think uh, the uh, proudest moment is just seeing both of them uh, end up as being, you know, uh, smart, successful individuals uh, uh, in very different ways, but uh, both uh, following their own path. I mean, I think that. Uh, when you look back, uh, it's not a moment, perhaps, but when you can look back and say, OK, somehow you managed not to screw this up uh, too badly. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's really uh, what I uh, drive the most. I, I love the line that says, as, as parents, we're not raising children, we're raising adults, right? Preparing them for the world. So it's, it's a good time. Uh, listen, I appreciate the time. We uh, once again talking to Roger Dooley, who is the author of Friction, the Untapped Force that can be your most powerful advantage. If people want to get in touch with you, learn more about your work and about your speaking, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, the best place to start would be rogerdooley.com. Uh, there you can find links to uh, my socials, uh, my YouTube channel, my Forbes column, and so on. And on social media, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, there's, that's where I spend probably most of my social media time. Also, Good, and, and we'll put your sense. contact information in this as well. And the last name is D-O-O-L-E-Y. So you can get in touch with him. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Hang on, because you and I will connect real quickly on the other side of this. Um, remind everybody, you can pick up a copy of my new book, which is The Morning Huddle, Powerful Customer Experience Conversations to Wake You Up and Shake You Up and Win More Business. As a matter of fact, all of my books that are strategically located next to my head on the video version are available on uh, on Amazon and most of them on Audible as well. Be sure to click to like this podcast, subscribe, leave your comments. Comments are really important, so please do that as well. You can click on the little bell to receive notifications of new episodes, and you can learn more about my keynote speaking, my consulting at davidaverin.com. Thanks for tuning in to the Why Customers Leave the podcast. Be sure to leave a comment. Big thanks to Roger Dooley for being my guest. I'm David Averin. Be good. This has been the Why Customers Leave podcast with David Averin. Be sure to leave a comment and click the like button. You can listen to or watch past episodes and be notified of future ones by hitting the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform or check them out on David Averin's YouTube channel. David's popular books are all available online and also in Kindle and audiobook form as well. You can learn more about David's keynote speaking and business consulting at davidaverin.com.